Well, welcome back to Grand Rapids. Good well, to see you. It's great to be back. And uh, yeah, I have a new role. I'm unemployed. <laughs> I think we have some call center openings, and we could talk later if okay, you're interested. Okay, very good. Okay. But seriously, how is it? What are you up to? Are you busy? Or? I'm, I'm catching up on an eight-year-old honeydew list. <laughs> uh, so it's what Sue says prior, is the priority right now. But in terms of things, actually, I've had a great opportunity to reconnect with a lot of people because I lost touch with uh, many people in the business community, and that's been great but also a chance to get back to some good nonprofit organizations. So I've been doing a lot of kind of consulting with people, uh, interested in looking at how I can help them be more successful. So I tell people my title now is helper. Um, and I just want to continue to help people on a smaller scale where I don't have to read about it in the newspaper every day. <laughs> so I think it's not just being governor. It's like you've had a very varied background, CEO of, of kind of the state, but it has uh, private equity and publicly traded. Tell us about the differences in those CEO roles. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I told someone this is my fifth career transition, and I, hopefully I'll figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up. <laughs> uh, so it's been a fabulous career. But there are some differences between the public and private sector. Um, but before I talk about the differences, one of the things that was interesting, when I was first campaigning, people said, well, you're a private company CEO. You just don't get it, uh, what a governor's about. And that's not true. And that's something many of you run organizations here or leaders in organizations, and you should be really proud of that um, because it's not just about making money. It's about helping your employees. It's about helping your community, your suppliers, your customers. I've always said there are all these constituencies, so it's not, you're just not this command and control person. You're doing a lot. So before I talk about the difference, recognize the similarities are very strong. The differences, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you don't have profit as a motive if you're in the public sector. You're there to serve. And that's an incredible opportunity, and I encourage each one of you to always think about that if you ever have the chance or the interest to do so. Um, there are some other differences, I would say, and they really fall into two or three kind of categories. Um, one thing I really did enjoy as governor is there is nothing in the private sector that has the diversity of things you got to work on as a governor. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> um, in terms of the areas. Everything from agriculture to corrections. I never thought, I actually had to sign a bear that involved the gestation cycle of bears. <laughs> uh, and if you think about all these areas, and being a proud nerd, I love that because it gave you an opportunity to learn about all these areas. Uh, the other thing is, is just the amount of scrutiny on everything you do. Mm -hmm. um, everything's underneath the microscope. I thought when I was in the private sector, I was actually fairly active in press relations and communications. I would get interviews on a regular basis. It wasn't even a speed bump uh, compared to what I had in this role, where literally we figured out on my schedule, on average, I did more than one interview per calendar day every day I was governor. Wow. That's Think about amazing. that. Um, and so there are some big differences there in terms of that. Um, and the other one is, is you, you just have to figure out how to keep connected with your family. It's tougher because of the scrutiny they get and the pressure on them. But overall, it was a wonderful experience. It was an honor to serve. I mean, when else do you get a chance to help 10 million people you care about? Yeah. And you were great. We Thank really you. enjoyed your leadership. Thank you. So I don't know if this happens like when I became president at Party Health. Lots of people gave me advice. I don't know when you become the governor, do people actually give you leadership advice? But if they did, what would be the most relevant or most important advice that you got? Yeah, there are two or three pieces of advice. Now, I'll, I'll put it in a bigger context, Joan, of advice that I relied on when I became governor in terms of things that were important to me. And some of it you've heard about today. It's great. There, I heard the last set of sessions, and there's a big correlation of some general principles. And we only have a couple minutes, so I'll be brief about this. Two or three principles on leadership I would share with you. Have a vision. Uh, my vision was to reinvent Michigan. We were a broken state. How do you bring people back together? I was fortunate. I did my first vision when I was a teenager. That was part of the nerd thing about where I wanted to take my life. I wanted to have several careers. And so I've stayed true to that path uh, since being a teenager. So vision's important. The next one is decision making. Um, and it's part of decision making and risk management. They sort of go together. And one of the most profound things that happened to me in my life is a book I actually happened to have in a poli sci class back in 1977 at the U of M, and it was on the Cuban Missile Crisis. And you go, how does that relate? A professor, Graham Allison, included in this book something called the rational actor model of decision making. 
They use it in foreign policy, but it made sense in my life, and so I kept it for decades. What's the problem? What are your alternatives? What are the consequences of the alternatives? And make a decision. And quite often in life, I find people sort of not managing risk, but avoiding risk. And I tell people that's one of the worst things you can do in your life is to put off a decision and sort of say, I, I don't want to make this decision. Well, I tell people, you've made a decision if you don't make a decision. And you're going to have to live with the consequences, so make a decision. And the last one I'll share with you in terms of general principles was empowerment. Um, when you're leading the state of Michigan, you're one person. And I was fortunate. I had the best team of people I've ever had to work with that were also engaged, that I was able to empower and get excited. And, and they were making decisions. That's how you accomplish tremendous things. And two other quick things I'll leave with you that aren't so much about organizational things, but I think are really important, um, is to really have a moral compass, to know what's important and to know who you represent. Because it was interesting. I had everything from lobbyists, usually in a positive way, calling on me, telling me how great I am and how they wanted <laughs> something, to protesters, to people out there saying how they didn't like me. And I can tell you in each and every case, I listened to them, I respected them, I understood that was part of the process. But to put it in perspective, my role wasn't to make them happy. My job was to represent 10 million people and to make the decisions I believe were the best for all those people in terms of going through that process. And I think that's something that too often we overlook. Yeah. Um, and the other part is just to know yourself and who you are and that you're not perfect. And how do you build that team again of people that can support you? And I always called it the philosophy, it's the golden rule. The last one I'd share with you is, do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. Um, and I've lived that my whole life, and that really started when I first started teaching. I taught my first class when I was 22 years old or 23. And the funny part is my students were the same age I was. So think about that. And I looked like a, a bum back then. I had a beard that wasn't very nice. I had jeans, a flannel shirt, and a backpack. And I was the instructor for this class. And so I thought about it as, I'm not better than they are, but I'm responsible for doing this class. And so I took the perspective to say, I'm the same as they are. I just happen to have more knowledge in the subject matter. And how do I share that with them? And how do I treat them with that respect? When I became governor and for my CEO days, I always translated to that as, Whenever I'd work with somebody in our organization, I never believed you should behave any differently for the person you work for versus who works for you. And to make sure you treat everyone with that same degree of respect. Because that's how you earn trust and that's how you be successful long term. Because we're all people. Yeah. Well, that's great. You know, you always did have that touch where you were so approachable. And I think that really shows through in who you are. Thanks. In our audience, we have a lot of like entrepreneurs. And would you give any different advice for entrepreneurs who are starting businesses or taking risks? I mean, is there anything unique in that situation? Well, there's a lot of unique things. Being an entrepreneur, congratulations. Um, you're not fully rational. <laughs> um, I've started things, the governor thing. I mean, if you think about it, by definition, if you're an entrepreneur and you're going off to do some new venture or something, uh, you're not fully rational in the conventional sense because if it was conventional, it would already be done. You're doing something that's new and innovative. Yeah. Uh, and so don't view that as a negative. That's a positive power to say you can go where someone doesn't believe you can go or you can do something you can't do. The other thing I would share with an entrepreneur is, is as you grow and if you really take off, figure out how to make that transition. And the great illustration is, Ted Waite hired me at Gateway to sort of be the person to come in to say, how do I take an entrepreneurial fast growth place, how do I make it a large organization now, but how do I do it in a way where we don't have chaos or bureaucracy? How do you do it in a way that keeps the positives of the culture and at the same time now has the structures and the pieces you need to be successful at a whole nother level, but you haven't lost that special spirit? Yeah. We heard a lot of different speakers talk about creating the culture. Yeah. It actually was resounding what great leaders talked about today was culture, culture, culture. How did you create a great culture? What's your tips around creating a culture? Yeah, a lot of it is vision, um, empowering people, but then creating this environment of openness, but teamwork. And what do I mean by that? And this is true stories in terms of being the governor. When we first got started, we were a broken state. So think about that. We were 50 out of 50 in how many different ways? Mm -hmm. And I didn't run for governor to say I'm aspiring to go to 47. 
right? <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> you had to aim for top 10. And are you going to get to top 10 by doing things the same old way? So we had to reinvent our state. We had to reinvent how we operated. We had to innovate. And if you think about innovation, it's hard in a private organization. It's much harder in the public sector because there's a risk of failure and there's a risk of criticism. So I told our team right at the start, if everything we worked on worked, it meant we weren't doing our jobs because we weren't pushing the envelope hard enough to do what we needed to do to be a top 10 state. And so we did tons of pilots, tons of things to try. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was part of it. The other one is this open attitude of saying, when we get in a meeting, um, obviously I recognized I was the governor, so I'd lay, <laughs> lay back a little bit, but let the discussion go. But I had times where I had senior people, much of our team, telling me I was nuts. I mean, that I was just wrong. I was going to be a one-term governor. We were going to be done. It was all over with. It's like, why are you going to do this in the first six months of office? You're going to screw <laughs> this thing up. You're going to be over with. You, we can't do this. And it's like, yes, we can. That's back that entrepreneurial spirit. And the point is, is we went ahead and did it. But the part I respected about my team, the culture we created is, is we could have that dialogue, we could have that discussion, but once a decision was made, everyone got 100% behind it. That's a unique thing. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so proud of the opportunity to work with these outstanding people. So that's something to always foster is, is have that environment where even the, the boss can be criticized in a constructive way. I mean, they weren't calling me names, they didn't have signs, but they were telling me I'm crazy. Um, but we went ahead and did stuff. You can do incredible things when you get people collaborating, cooperating, and so it evolved where I learned from them. And I still tell people, uh, several people on our senior staff, I viewed as mentors to me, even though they technically work for me. Yeah, that's really cool. We talked a little bit today about that talent shortage, the millennials, yeah. how work is evolving and changing, the workplace. What's your perspective on that? Uh, it's one of the, it would be, probably one of the two most significant issues facing our society and our country. Wow. Uh, number one is civility, the lack of civility in our country. Uh, we, can, we will not continue to be the greatest country in the world if we can't get along with ourselves. And so I'm... <laughs> and to be blunt, I don't just believe in bring up problems, my solution is relentless positive action. No blame, no credit, what's the problem, what's the solution, and be relentless in the pursuit of solutions. And I believe I lived that for eight years as a governor. So it is possible in public leadership to do that in our country. The second thing, though, is this talent issue and the, getting people career connected. Where the jobs are, where the careers are, the future is going to transition dramatically, folks. It's not going to happen as fast in some areas as it may seem in the public press, but it is coming. And the, my concern is, in America, we tend to wait for the crisis. Um, we're great when there are crises. I mean, we'll rally like no one else. But you can see this coming. And if you look at the public dialogue and discussion going on today, the percentage of talk that's going on about this issue is probably less than 1% to 2% of the national dialogue. That's scary to me. Um, it's going to be an exciting opportunity and a scary situation. There are whole new fields coming. Mobility is going to transition everyone. If you think of anyone that's driving a vehicle today, is that going to be true in 50 years? Probably not. If you think anyone that's a cashier, they're probably not going to have their position. I'm not trying to scare them today, but to say over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, shouldn't we be figuring out how to make sure they're getting retrained, they're getting new career opportunities, they're having new things go on. So this whole concept of education, it's great the dialogue that was taking place on Mackinac, I track some of that, but my concern is I'm not sure it's reinventing enough, rather than saying let's take a system and try to make it better versus saying let's build what we need for the future, which in many respects, think about this, is one of the greatest things we're missing in my view is lifelong learning. All those things I talked about, most of us that are going to have a working career over the next 50 years are going to go through two or three major transitions where you're going to need significant training, retraining, um, maybe even reorientation to a whole new field. How well are we set up today? So it's interesting, when I talk to our university people, our community college people, a lot of those folks, I said, what you're doing is going to change dramatically. And I said, don't get mad at me for bringing this up, but change your mindset. Your mindset, you're focusing on a market share of 
16 to 25 year olds largely. I said, you need to broaden that to say your mind share, your market share needs to go through somebody 85 or 95, somebody like me. I can be trained still, ask Sue, my <laughs> wife. <laughs> so we need to really start this thing about lifelong learning certificates, building certificates over time that are modular, that layer up on one another. We started with the Marshall Plan. So I'm really proud. We put in a foundational step with the Marshall Plan for talent, but it needs to be nurtured, it needs to be developed. And Michigan can be the world's leader in this if we get on top of it. Yeah, I think it is a huge issue for the future and there's so much change coming. It's, it is scary to consider sometimes. And, and you've started a new business too, right? Is it RP? Yeah, I created RP Action LLC. I guess you can figure out what that yeah. means. <laughs> but it's really a chance to say, if I can help people on leadership issues, strategic plan, again, visioning, um, because I do have some strong feelings. And one thing I, we haven't talked about that I'm really keen on that was a subject here is mentorship. I am who I am because I was fortunate enough to find great mentors. And we need to do much more mentorship. So that's one of the things I'm looking to say. I'd love to be part of creating an organization to ramp that up. And what Mike Jander knows, I done, was going to say, he's yeah. a home run shot. Mike, thank you. <laughs> but I'd like to say, is there a version we can do that literally could have thousands of people involved, or hundreds of thousands at some point? And the reason I say mentorship is going to be more important in the future than in the past, and I'll try to do this quickly, Joan, but I think this is important for people to think about because it's one of the things that's causing the lack of civility in our country, everything else, is the velocity of change in people's lives is only going faster and faster. Mm -hmm. And the amount of decisions, the amount of traumatic issues people are having to face to say, where's my career going? Where's the future going? Where's the, is my quality of life at jeopardy? Is one of the reasons you're seeing the left and the right have these political issues, and unfortunately it's being channeled to negativity they're being taken and channeled off into negative energy. Um, what we need to do is bring people back together on common goals because they have the same issue. They're worried about where their future is or their kids' future. And if you think about it, social media is actually contributing to the problem more than it's helping with the problem. So I've talked about a lot of bad things, but what would be one of the key parts of a solution? It's mentorship. Mentorship is what helped make my life, but if you think about it, if you're in a situation where you're facing more and more things being thrown at you, saying I have to make more and more decisions, fundamental decisions on your life, what's the key thing? Having trusted guides to help you through that process. Not a boss, as Mike said, not somebody telling you what to do, but someone you can go to that you have a personal relationship with that you trust that you can ask those questions to give you the confidence, the ability to make a sound decision. Again, not avoiding a decision to make sound decisions and move forward. So my view is we need to spend more time on mentorship now in the upcoming future than we ever did in the past. Yeah, well, I could see you coming alive over that <laughs> issue. I think we do need to have you and Mike uh, in a room after this, because he's done so much yeah. great work and, and I can see your passion around it too. This is gonna be totally, crazy conversation, but have you ever really thought of yourself as a, a fashion guy? Because if you look around the room, not many ties in the audience, and you set a whole new tone for Michigan. Well, the good part is the, the Grand Hotel had Snyder Casual occasionally, where you could get away without a tie. That was a big move, folks. I worked on that for years. I don't know if it's still holding up, though. It may have gotten blown up. Um, but the funny story is a cultural question, or a cultural situation that caused the no tie. Um, that didn't have anything to do with government. And to give you a little background, when I first came back to Michigan, I was asked to host a session to actually be the moderator and leader of a session of our entrepreneurs in our venture community, our startup community in the state, uh, for the tech community. Not the, this, there's so many great manufacturing businesses here, but that was the tech people. So I go to this place and I said, I'm brand new back to Michigan, I have no idea what to wear, so I put on a suit. I'd been at Gateway, I'd had cowboy boots and jeans to wear to work. Um, but I wore a suit because I wanted to be safe about it. So I get to this room and I walk in, there's 100 people in this room. Uh, there were 97 people in ties. There were two women and a guy in a Dexter High sweatshirt. And we go to the first break. And this is supposed to be our tech community, folks, our startup tech community. And I get to the first break and I said, we have no hope if we don't lighten up our culture here, if we don't change. And I took off my tie then and I said, I'm done. I said, I'm not wearing ties anymore. 
except I said, when everyone stops wearing a tie, I might start wearing a tie again. <laughs> because it's that continual innovation and just keeping that freshness going. So that's where the no tie actually came from. Wow, there's actually a story behind the no tie. That's good. I'm not sure you're glad you asked that question or not. Um, one last question. Let me ask you about venture capital. Yeah. I, you know, I read a lot about the different things that's going on in venture capital in Michigan. We're really trying to expand. What do you see in terms of our Michigan venture capital activity? Yeah, the whole ecosystem from startups to angel investment to venture cap has made tremendous progress. Um, and that's a whole separate speech, but it's made tremendous progress. A couple things I would share, though, is we are far too many islands still. So my belief is um, we need a better coordinating mechanism, not, somebody, not a command and control mechanism, but we have way too many people. I mean, can anyone tell me how many incubators there are probably in Metro Grand Rapids? Um, and it's cool in one way, you want to encourage that, but in another way, are they talking? Because we're still not at the scale of critical mass in the entire state that we need to be at. We may be, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so we need a better coordinating mechanism to get people just collaborating, cooperating, understanding that it's all open source. We should be sharing everything. Um, because that would be our power. And you can see the power is when we've been able to bring the state together. I mean, the illustration I always give people is the grand bargain. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the finest, greatest illustrations of think about this. And I know that would be true of many people in this audience that if I went back 10 years, did you criticize Detroit? Um, and if I go back today, would you say nice things about Detroit, about the great comeback? Uh, the grand bargain and all that process was a catalyst. So that's one of the things I really looked at is could I be a cultural change agent to help make that transition happen? And the power of Michigan when we're all one Michigan, and that was talked on Mackinac, is we need to continue to sustain that. Yeah. So I think it's really exciting. We've got a bright future. We just need to continuously improve and look at this reinvention question in a fast evolving world. So it's a big transition. People talk all the time about retirement and how that feels. But you're not going to retire. You're going to keep going, which is kind of what people do these days. When they retire, they start to work on their passion. And how is that transition? What advice would you give to people thinking about making that change? Maybe it's just a scheduling change, as was said earlier in the panel. Yeah, no, yeah, it is. A, so longer term, people that know me know I have a personality profile that, no, I'm like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to keep going. But you have to go through the phases of understanding, going from governor, you're going 100 miles an hour or faster to zero. Yeah. And so that was a transition. Um, actually, as Sue's on a vacation right now because I've been around her enough. <laughs> <laughs> she was really happy to have me around for a while, but then it's like, so the classic is we were coming in and somebody asked me if I wanted coffee because I, I, have you gotten over your caffeine addiction being governor? I said, no. Thank God no one gave me caffeine. My staff, would, <laughs> everyone would have been terrified. Me on caffeine, look out. So it gets back to the point, though, I mentioned earlier about knowing yourself mm -hmm. and having confidence in who you are, but also how you can give back and give value to people. Um, because when I stopped and looked at it, I mentioned I was doing my fifth career transition. For me, that was a huge benefit, and most people wouldn't have that, because I've done the, I did this four other times. Right. Uh, this one is different, but you, but you know when you're starting over again, there's a bright future. And that's a message we need everyone to always have, is if, if, if something happens, if I became unemployed, that there's a bright future out there, you just need to, again, make, have a vision, make decisions, empower people around you to help support you, find mentors to go through that process, and push forward yeah. in a positive, constructive way. So I know it's gonna turn out well. Um, it won't be a straight line, nothing ever has been, um, but that's where hopefully I can give back. So those are the kind of messages I do wanna share with younger people or other people I can be constructive with. That's such a wonderful message. I think that's a great note to lead on. Thank you so much uh, for your time and energy here today. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. So stay with uh, Stay with me for a moment, because okay. as a small token of our appreciation, I would like to invite uh, Brett Vanderkamp. 
He's the president of Howland New, Bru uh, New Holland Brewing Company, and he's going to do a little recognition with for you. Come on up, Brett. Governor, uh, on behalf of New Holland Brewing Company and really business leaders, uh, all of us out here, um, we want to thank you for the positive impact you've had on our state and the positive uh, impact specifically you've had on business. Um, to that end, we went to the drawing board and um, there was some debate of the name. As you can imagine, one tough nerd was in the running. Uh, however, we felt the legacy you're leaving of your relentless positive uh, attitude an action, uh, excuse me. Uh, we just transformed to a relentless positive ale. And uh, so <laughs> this is the first ever six pack and uh, thank you. Oh, great, thank you. That's awesome, thanks. <laughs> That's wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Brett. Thank you very much.